It's, it's really important to know that when we see the most symptomatic patients, we're looking at the relationship of the entire anatomic segment to the sort of you know, central points of obstruction. And so iliofemoral DVT is uh, uh, depicting a particularly symptomatic population because the common femoral vein and the external iliac vein are completely obstructed. And so all points of egress from the lower extremity if they can't get out through the common femoral vein, is going to create a, a very, very uh, symptomatic limb, significant venous hypertension, and uh, uh, again, the highest Volalta scores, the highest VCSS scores, as Dr. Sist was alluding to in the previous presentation. Similarly, however, in the uh, lower limb, in the calf, if the popliteal vein is completely occluded, which I'll spend next six or seven minutes ago focusing on, you're going to have a very, very symptomatic calf. Um, and this is a, a subgroup of patients that I think is probably not getting necessarily enough attention um, now that we have the appropriate tools and experience to be able to uh, take care of that. So again, Aki did a great job of summarizing this. This really was the pivotal trial of the last decade to try and determine whether or not there was a um, evidence base. And obviously, uh, as he summarized, this was a negative trial showing no clear benefit except perhaps in the treatment of moderates, uh, in the reduction of moderate to severe post-thrombotic syndrome. Um, the uh, subsequent publications, um, including the risk stratification of iliofemoral DVT and femoral popliteal DVT, have been thought-provoking, uh, th thought to say that the least. Uh, m numerous outcomes have been positive for iliofemoral DVT, and I, and I think there is a a growing consensus that we should be probably a little bit more open-minded about treating the most symptomatic patients with low bleeding risk with iliofemoral DVT and offering them endovascular therapy. With femoral popliteal DVT, I'm not going to belabor this point because Aki really did an unbelievable job summarizing this, but there was no statistical value in treating femoral popliteal DVT whatsoever. And so routine treatment of even a uh, significantly symptomatic acute femoral popliteal T is, is absolutely not evidence-based whatsoever and is not uh, a warranted. And uh, again, just to really drill this home, uh, that the greatest benefit in the ATTRACT trial was for proximal and, uh, again, common femoral vein and above, iliofemoral DVT, with acute symptoms, acute severe symptoms, young patients with low, uh, with low bleeding risk. And, and I think many of us that have uh, busy endovascular venous practices has, have, have migrated to this uh, patient population to explore endovascular therapy and, and have really not moved past that. And I, and I think the future science is going to have to sort of do an even deeper dive as to whether or not we have true evidence to treat this population, whether we should expand it, whether we should refine it even further. So I just want to give a slightly different perspective, and I'm going I'm to move a little bit away from a, acute femoral popliteal DVT to chronic uh, femoral popliteal DVT. And this was a, a relatively young woman who uh, we saw in the office who um, had a, a femoral popliteal DVT, um, and she had uh, a superficial vein ablation um, at an outside institution uh, several months uh, prior. And she had a very, very symptomatic lower limb. Uh, and this was after months of uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. You can see here she's on rivaroxaban at a, a therapeutic dose. Um, she was compliant with um, elastic-rated compression stockings and was really just miserable, felt that she had uh, an inability to ambulate optimally. Uh, her, she was in a, a moderate amount of, uh, of uh, pain, really couldn't be active at, uh, at work, couldn't participate in her you know, home life to the extent that she wanted to. And Essentially, what she had when she was originally diagnosed was, you know, essentially femoral popliteal DVT. It did sort of cross into the uh, calf veins, but again, this was an infrainguinal DVT, and so I think rightly so, nobody offered her endovascular therapy. Um, but she was in uh, a, a moderate amount of, uh, of uh, symptoms, and we were sort of perplexed months after the initial event, sort of what to do with her. And, and again, you can see her exam, her right limb is um, uh, certainly more damaged than her uh, left limb. She has uh, uh, 
uh, varicosities around her uh, knee, uh, depicting the degree of venous hypertension that she has in that limb. Um, and again, we were just sort of struggling as to how to manage her, and she was really sort of desperate for any kind of um, relief. Her laboratory exam was unremarkable. So as we frequently do in this circumstance, we try and see if there's any degree of venous outflow obstruction, and this is the MRV, which is our sort of go-to go non-invasive uh, uh, imaging study, especially if the um, lower extremity Doppler show you know, relatively normal respiratory variation. We want to look even higher, make sure there's nothing else going on here. And I can very confidently say that this MRV enogram is consistent with a reading of normal. Uh, no significant compression. The central veins are patent. And so the, the confounder that maybe she has a central venous obstruction was not realized on this MRV. So now we're sort of like, well, all right, what do, what, what do we do here? And essentially what we decided to do was to explore her deep veins in her right lower leg and the infraguinal circulation. And what we had sorted out was that by a repeat Doppler in the office, despite her central veins being completely open, that her popliteal vein in the right leg was 100% occluded in the above knee uh, segment. And we felt that you know, with current techniques, we could likely recanalize this and hopefully decompress her and give her some symptomatic relief. Um, and we've done this in a number of patients so far. We've actually had uh, significant success. So I'll just sort of walk you through this uh, case on this uh, patient. Um, my, my preference is, is I'm going to do this. I usually use two, two accesses, one from above and one from below. How you choose to go from above is really dealer's choice. You can either go from the jugular vein and go straight down as a, as a, as, as a column down to the uh, femoral popliteal venous segment. You can also go up and over. That's not my personal preference. And then we usually have a, uh, an access sheath in the uh, in the veins in the uh, calf. And so here's the initial venogram. And again, we have a, a, a guiding system from the neck down into the femoral vein. And we're injecting here. And essentially here, uh, we're hitting a brick wall, meaning that we, 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 we can't easily get a wire to pass this point. Obviously, this is the distal femur. The popliteal vein is approximately here. And we are stuck, uh, can't cross. And so um, we're trying to go from uh, below. There's, there's no patent segment here across the entire um, uh, popliteal venous segment. And we have essentially dueling catheters trying to meet in, in the, uh, in the uh, middle, and we're just really not able to get them to meet whatsoever. Um, what we were able to do after uh, probably about 20 or 30 minutes or so of uh, sort of uh, testing different options with, uh, with guide wires is we were actually able to um, cross with almost a, a coronary profile wire, snare it out from the neck, and then as it implies based on this video, we have a guide wire coming from the ankle all the way out through the patient's neck. Now it is a very, very uh, small platform uh, to work over, a 14,000 inch guide wire, but essentially we've established continuity. And then it just was really a, a very, very simple steps of dilating the uh, entire segment. So we have, again, a wire from the posterior tibial vein up to the popliteal vein. We're going to two, two and a half, three, four, five, um, all the way up to establish um, continuous flow. And this looked good, um, but we felt this could look better. And again, there was a, a sort of uh, a rate limiting step here going from the posterior tibial vein up to the popliteal vein, where you can see all this synechiae and scar tissue from this chronic DVT here. Um, and so we sort of went even more aggressive with balloon angioplasty. And we'll typically stop here at somewhere around eight millimeters. We think that's probably the, the right size to stop for uh, slightly more petite patients, maybe a seven millimeter balloon. For much, much, much larger patients, maybe a nine millimeter balloon. But I think in this case, we used an eight millimeter balloon. And what we're actually able to do, and you can see here, is we're able to establish uninterrupted flow. There was some small collaterals, but uh, essentially uninterrupted straight line flow from the ankle up through the femoral popliteal uh, venous segment. And we saw her the next month, and we actually saw her six months later, and we actually have seen her nine months later now. And she actually says that she's 75 to 80% better. Um, and while the Doppler shows that there's chronic 
residual popliteal vein thrombus, there's actually flow through it. Uh, and so it's behaving much more like a recanalized segment than a completely chronically um, occluded segment. And uh, she obviously is very, very grateful that she was able to get symptomatic relief. We're following her very, very closely with serial Dopplers every three months. Um, but I think this is one potential option for endovascular therapy for femoral popliteal DVT. Just to summarize the sort of technical tips that we found, we think if you're gonna tackle this for 100% chronic occlusions, dual access is absolutely key. Um, you wanna have either uh, a, a calf access and a contral femoral access, or calf access and perhaps jugular access. The patient should really be treated on therapeutic anticoagulation. We're actually very liberal with the use of antiplatelet therapy as well. And then very, very liberal uh, balloon angioplasty, eight millimeters for the popliteal vein, 10 millimeters and above for the femoral veins. We never, ever, 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 I'm gonna say it again, ever stent the femoral popliteal veins. Don't do it, even if he looks like you should do it, don't do it, it is a bad idea. The devices are not built for this anatomic region. There's never been any study that's ever shown any clinical benefit whatsoever. So we r remain uh, to this day with just plain balloon angioplasty and we follow our patients extremely closely with serial Doppler. If they start to develop uh, either recurrent thrombosis of the treated segment or they develop recurrent symptoms, we usually will bring them back and do a repeat angioplasty. It can be done as an outpatient ambulatory procedure to improve the patient's symptomatology. So thank you for your attention.